to another episode of Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. Let's suppose you're on an airplane and you sit down next to someone, a middle-aged person, and you ask them what they do, and they tell you they're a poet. And let's suppose that the conversation doesn't end right there. Now, just based on that information, you've probably already formed some kind of impression of this person's mental and emotional life and the kinds of goals and aspirations that he or she has in sort of conveying certain kinds of internal states via the vehicle of poetry. And these assumptions would be very much a part of the sort of conventions about what we understand a poet and poetry to be in the modern era. So let's also suppose that you're much braver than I am, and you ask this person to show you samples of the poetry in question. The odds are that you will be very surprised if that poetry turns out to be, say, a narrative poetry, right? a story a novel, an epic story, or whatever, told in poetic form. You will also be surprised if it turns out to be a glowing panegyric praise of that person's employer or of a current political figure, and that this is offered to you as sincere, like, no, this is my poetry. I'm not just some political hack who's just paid to write whatever. You will also be surprised if the poem turns out to be um, meant to accompany, let's say, a product, right? In which case, you're going to start to think, okay, you're a poet like a musician is who writes jingles for advertisements or something like that. But nevertheless, that is poetry. It just doesn't jibe with our dominant image of what a poet is. Okay, so Byzantine poetry finds itself in an awkward position like this, and it's being squeezed from both sides. In other words, there are very powerful ideas about what a poet and what poetry are that don't quite match what we find in the domain of Byzantine writing literature more broadly, and that has caused a a misalignment of categories, and the result is inevitably rather disparaging comments being made about Byzantine poetry. And those two models that squeeze it from both ends are, on the one hand, our modern, um, very romantic image of the poet as someone who's channeling authentic feelings and so so forth. And on the other hand, um, ancient poetry, specifically the sort of cultural prestige and literary distinction accorded to the tragedians and ancient poetry general, lyric poetry, and so forth, that even the Byzantines recognized it as a kind of normative model, uh, but the poetry didn't operate in Byzantine culture in, in the same way as it did in archaic Greece or democratic Athens. And so Byzantine poetry has been caught between those two models and inevitably has failed to compete with them, and so some pretty terrible things have been written about it. Fortunately, for the past 20 years or so, my guest today has done an extraordinary amount of excellent work trying to reposition Byzantine poetry in its own context so that we can try to understand what it was doing, how it was supposed to function by those who were producing it and consuming it, um, and tying it closely to the original contexts in which it was produced and for which it was intended, and deferring for the moment the more abstract task of sort of understanding it on its own apart from those contexts. Like, can it travel diachronically and across cultures and across languages? That is a separate issue. First, we need to understand what the people who were doing it and producing it, and also later copying it into manuscripts, which is you know part of that uh, trajectory toward a kind of more detached appreciation of it. You know, what did they think they were doing? My guest is Mark Laugstermann, a professor at Oxford. 
And in addition to numerous uh, articles and chapters, you can find the, the core of his thinking and his analysis of Byzantine poetry in a two-volume book called Byzantine Poetry, From Pisidis to Geometries. These are the names of two Byzantine poets. The subtitle of the volume is crucial. It is Texts and Contexts. Now, in this conversation, Mark and I discuss some of the false ideas about poetry, or rather the culturally inappropriate ones that have sometimes been used to uh, evaluate it and ultimately disparage it. And then we turn to some of those original contexts and how they gave rise to poetic texts. Now, we tend to focus in the discussion on poems that accompany things, that whether books, objects, monuments and buildings, events, celebrations, and so forth. In other words, the text is a poetic commentary on something else that is attached or adjacent to it. It is not meant to be a self-standing you know, original composition that can be appreciated by anyone in any anywhere. I wanted to give you a couple of examples of these kinds of texts so you have them in, in your head when you hear us talking about them. So I'm just going to quote some of these texts from Mark's book, which he's translated or paraphrased, just so you get a sense of them. So this is a verse inscription that accompanies a painting in a church of the 40 martyrs of Sebastia, uh, so, you know, these are some men who were who chose to die for their faith, and they're depicted as freezing to death uh, in the image. And the poem that accompanies that image is the following: Winter it is that causes pain; flesh it is that suffers here. If you pay attention, you may even hear the groans of the martyrs. But if you do not listen, they will still endure the violent cold looking to their crowns and not to their toils. So you're clearly meant to be looking at an image, and the poem is a kind of commentary on that image. Another one was written by one of the best poets in the Byzantine tradition, Ioannis Geometris, the one who's mentioned in the title of Mark's book. And at one point he dedicated a icon of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, made of very precious materials, and he accompanied it by a short epigram, uh, which is the following. His body and spirit worn out by hardships, John depicted her who is immaculate in body and soul so as to regain his health and good spirits. Golden stones belong to the earth, but the art is thine, O word. Now, I don't want to give the impression that all Byzantine poetry is of this get sort of you know, functional or you know adjacent quality there's actually quite a diversity of topics and and approaches and styles and so forth um in the you know corpus as a whole it's not even a very unified corpus i, I want to read you uh, a paraphrase that mark has written of uh, another sort of longer poem that describes an excursion of some byzantine friends in the bosporus and I wanted to read this to you in in part to refute the kinds of ideas that you may have come across um, that is kind of Orientalist tropes that the Byzantines, for example, had no appreciation for natural beauty or things like this that when occasion or for landscape. Anyway, you fill in the blank. I, I, I think it's an extraordinary composition, and this is how Mark describes it. One late summer afternoon at the turn of the millennium, so around one, the year 1000, a group of friends was making a pleasant boat trip on the Bosporus. While the sun was setting, they sailed along the coast, admiring from a distance the prosperous olive yards and orchards. The water was purplish. Soft breezes bellied out the sails. And as the boat headed toward the Propendus, the Sea of Marmara, the sailors were singing shanties in time to their work. The waves were murmuring gently, the birds were warbling, and nature as a whole was one sweet harmony. The passengers aboard were absolutely thrilled. Halfway on their voyage, they even spotted some dolphins turning somersaults in the waves. It was almost as if these dolphins, the friends of the muses, were there to welcome them and encourage them to take part in the universal merriment. It was clearly the right moment for poetry. They thought, and since they had been imbibing substantial amounts of wine during the trip, 
they were also in the right mood for some literary entertainment. So the whole company started to recite by turns. They declaimed with great enthusiasm, and all sorts of texts could be heard. The sweet flower of words, ranging from the melodious rhythms of iambic poetry and the smooth harmonies of ancient epics to the well-balanced periods of rhetorical prose. They had a wonderful time, and when they finally returned to Constantinople, after hours of declamation, the sun had already gone down, they felt that they had enjoyed all that is good in life. Well, that's a nice image. So here's my conversation with Mark Laugsterman. Mark Laugsterman, welcome to the podcast. Nice um, talking to you. So I think it's fair to say that your work on Byzantine poetry has been the most influential in the past 20 years. I can remember in graduate school before you wrote what you wrote, your, your two-volume book, that the views of Byzantine poetry that were expressed very commonly in scholarship were very, very negative. Uh, and I wanted us to talk a little bit about why that was. That is, what kinds of ideas about poetry were interfering uh, with our reading of Byzantine texts? And then we can talk a little bit later about some the m models that you've proposed in order to fix that and how should we look at Byzantine poetry in its own context. But let me start first with a question about the figure of the poet, right? So I get the sense that when we talk about poetry today, we we have this sense of this romantic image of the poet and of poetry and its function and its nature sort of looming over us and interfering with uh, reading poetry from previous uh, eras. So was there a sense in Byzantium of, you know, being a poet as a kind of identity, or is it just poetry was something that people that who had other identities did on the side or occasionally, or was there such a thing as a poet, someone who could you know, put on airs or something because of being a poet? No, I don't think there is a category which we could uh, describe as the poet. First of all, um, um, you're right in saying that our conception of poetry is basically a 19th century idea of uh, the, so the, the inspired poet, the genius, seeing things ordinary people can't see, those ideas are quite recent uh, and cannot be found before, well, hardly, can hardly be found before the, uh, the be beginning of the 19th century. Um, and they were certainly not common in uh, the Byzantine period at all. If you look at the Byzantines and their own perception of literature, um, what you'll see is that the most common term is logoi. Logoi are uh, it's very difficult to translate because it, it both words, concepts, ideas, and it encompasses much more than what we would nowadays call literature. It is more what in German sometimes called schriftum or in modern Greek grammatia. So it, it is basically anything an intellectual, and a person with some education could possibly be interested in. So it's not just what we would call literature, but also say uh, uh, a treatise on medicine or, uh, or even a juridical text or, uh, well, um, we can fill in, fill in the blanks. It's basically anything that you, uh, that uh, intellectuals may be interested in. That's a law goals. And those working on it are called, are named after the law. They are the logioi, the, the intellectuals. Um, and I don't think there is a real distinction between poetry and prose in the first place in the, in the Middle Ages. And if you look at uh, the people writing poetry, they all, we we'll also write prose, and of course that's common too for uh, modern times, in which more cases of poetry too will sometimes write a novel or uh, write something else or write a, a newspaper column. But there is not a distinct category poet in, in, uh, 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 in Byzantine times. In fact, if you look at the word PETs, which is uh, probably the, what we would call a poet, it's usually if, if, if it re, uh, refers to a Byzantine person, it is used for the poet of the circus factions. Uh, the circus factions, uh, uh, the, the people are claiming the emperor in, in the Hippodrome where they kept the, 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 the chariot, chariot races would have their own staff 
and one person is called the PET. He's the poet. He's mm -hmm. writing the, the hymns for, uh, for the circus factions. Otherwise, the word PET is almost exclusively used for Homer and, uh, and sometimes for other classical authors, but it's not, well, as far as I know, almost never used for any Byzantine poet. So they simply didn't think in those terms of um, uh, modern terms of poetry as being separated from, from the rest of society. So you mentioned Homer. Let me ask about that, because as you were speaking, I thought, well, you know, Zedzis and Eustathius of Thessaloniki, so these are 12th century scholars, when they they write about Homer and they they do, you know, exalt him as someone of unusual insight and utility and brilliance and genius in a way that, you know, sort of resembles the idea of the modern inspired poet. You know, though obviously they didn't think he was inspired as such, but is that kind of praise that they could bestow on a writer of prose as well? Or, or is there something inherently poetic about the way they see him? Homer, you mean? Yes, uh, yes. Not, yeah. yeah, I know this doesn't apply to Byzantine poets, but maybe they had this conception of a genius poet, even if it was someone who lived, you know, thousands of years before. You, you see, the thing with Homer is that Greek education uh, uh, starts with Homer. That, that's basically what's, what's going on. Homer is central to the Byzantine educational system. Uh, a student, uh, well, pupil, a child, will begin with the Psalter, with Psalms, and then move on to Homer. And since Homer is so central to, to the Byzantine educational system, he is the P.T.s par excellence. Uh, uh, he is uh, indeed the poet, the great poet. By the way, just as the uh, alleged author of the Psalms, David, to, mm -hmm. yeah. it can be uh, the, the, the poet or the Orpheus of, uh, of our uh, religion, etc., right. etc. Et uh, so it's those two central figures that, that may perhaps be called poets. Uh, uh, but apart from that, I, I don't think that uh, the, the poets that we nowadays th think well, considered to be the well uh, among the best in Byzantium, uh, people like uh, John Mavropoulos in the eleventh century, or uh, Christopher Mytilinaeus also in the eleventh century, or Fyodor Prodromos in the twelfth century. So they were clearly, clearly recognized in their own times as exceptionally good writers. Uh, held, held the status of poets, they were just very, very uh, uh, intelligent writers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's turn to ideas about poetry that might be getting in the way, you know, between us and reading Byzantine poetry in its own terms. So again, romantic ideas about poetry would include that it is some kind of authentic expression of a poet's emotions and feelings, right? Some kind of something like that, right? Yeah. And that's not a function of Byzantine poetry, right? That, that's not no, what its goal. Not at all. I mean, um, um, it has nothing to do with Wordsworth and, and um, um, not at all. Um, it is quite, quite different, uh, I would say, to, to our expectations. But the, you're right that the romantic conception has done uh, a great harm to the study of Byzantine poetry in general. It, it even goes down to, to the, the language we use. Um, if you open all the histories of Byzantine literature, you will see that Byzantine poetry is divided into three categories, uh, epic, drama, and uh, lyric, uh, poetry, lyrical poetry. This now goes back to Hegel and Schlegel and all those fantastic German uh, uh, romantic thinkers but it has nothing to do with uh, the Middle Ages. In fact, it, it is a misconception of Plato because it goes back all the way to Plato, but whereas Plato is referring to the way of narrating. So a drama is a text in which the characters are speaking. Epic is a text in which the narrator, say the poet, Homer himself, may be speaking or he can introduce the characters and let them speak. So that's a mixed genre. And lyrical poetry, that's the kind of poetry in which the poet himself 
or herself speaks. So it has to do with uh, voice. Uh, basically, it's about voice. It doesn't have anything to do with genre. Uh, uh, so Plato has totally been mis misunderstood by the Romantics who thought that he was talking about genre, which he wasn't. So the strange thing now is that the highest form of poetry, according to Plato, which is the genre of the different or lyrical poetry, is a fact comes very close to uh, uh, many forms of in poetry in which the author will be speaking in his own voice. So uh, it's justice after all for the Byzantines. They were writing the kind of lyrical poetry uh, Plato was talking about. But of course, it's it, it's total mess up. It, it's confusion between uh, uh, mm. uh, in terms, and we shouldn't be using words like that. I mean, drama. That there is hardly any drama in, in the Middle Ages, simply because uh, playhouses stopped uh, uh, ceased to function in the Middle Ages. So, well. Theatre is being replaced by uh, all kinds of ceremonies. It is uh, by the liturgy, but uh, there, is, there is no drama. Uh, and epic, it also very, was, it's of course a matter of discussion uh, whether you would want to call the, the novel a form of epic. Well, you may do so, uh, and then you will say, yes, the Byzantines did write novels in verse, but also in prose, but it doesn't help uh, much. I mean, basically, you are introducing terms that do not apply to another kind of literature. Yeah, and uh, using Plato's categories and applying them to any any period of literature is a problem, mm -hmm. uh, especially when Plato himself, you know, I mean, he's almost reflecting the, the division of his own dialogues, right? Because his own dialogues are sometimes reported, sometimes narrated, sometimes in the first person, and yeah, uh, you, you can't pull those categories out of his own, con out of Plato's concern for his own corpus and what he's creating in, in terms of philosophy. But anyway, yeah, so we have these, these ancient categories that get in the way, and we have these modern categories that get in the way. And you mentioned the language. There's also a problem with language, um, specifically with regard to poetry, because ancient poetry established certain norms that classicists, you know, respect with regard to poetry, especially meter. And you've written at great length about how changes in the language, especially the pronunciation and the, the loss of long vowels and diphthongs and things like this could put completely, um, but they didn't change the meters as such and Byzantine writers could use them, but they were just completely irrelevant after a certain point. And mm -hmm. classical scholars or Byzantine scholars who came out of classical studies looking at these texts that don't seem to make any sense according to ancient you know, prosody and so forth, uh, disparage them. Could you talk a little bit about those changes in the, in the language that resulted in changes in meter? And, and when did the Byzantines come up with meters that reflected their own spoken language better? Um, it, it's a gradual process, uh, as, you, uh, as you already indicated. There are two uh, linguistic changes that affected poetry. Uh, um, the first one is the, uh, the change from what are called a musical or pitch accent, just as you have in some Oriental languages, such as Chinese, where if you listen to people, you can hear that the voice goes up and down, up and down, that's a pitch. Uh, and that's called a pitch accent. Modern language, modern European language, such as English, have a stress accent. Uh, we, we stress uh, syllables. So uh, Greek uh, developed from a pitch to a stress accent. And the second major development is indeed the loss of prosodic uh, differentiation in the length of vowels. Prosodic simply means that the time, uh, the length of time necessary to uh, pronounce a word. So ancient Greek has a differentiation between a and a. Uh, so the, 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 there's a short a and a long a. Um, Modern Greek, the, the outcome of all this development, doesn't. Uh, so it's just, um, the problem now is that in classical poetry, it is possible to pronounce two short vowels in the uh, in the amount of time necessary to pronounce one long syllable. But once that luxury uh, ceased to exist because all vowels had the same length, 
there was a problem. Think of the word potamos. Potamos means river. Potamos has uh, the first two syllables of potamos are both short. What a classical poet would do if uh, uh, if one of his characters approached a river would probably if, uh, use the word potamos as two short ones in place of one long one. Mm. Disney and Orpha didn't have that luxury. But of course, you can't write poetry without ever mentioning a uh, river. River is so essential to, to, to life. So what they did is uh, they arbitrarily lengthened one of the two syllables in the word potamos. What they did usually, if they were good poets, they would choose the alpha, because mm. if you lengthen the alpha of potamos, you can't see it, you can't recognize it. On the other hand, if you were to lengthen the O of Potamos, Po, then there is obviously the question that Omicron is always short, it is recognizably short because the, the long O is Omega. So, um, they, so what the good poets will always do is kind of conceal the fact that they are arbitrarily lengthening uh, uh, vowels. But the point is that you can't criticize the Byzantines for dealing with what is really a huge problem. Because if you can't, uh, if you still feel that the ancient prosody should be used in your poetry, then uh, that's the only way out. And that's uh, exactly what he did. The question, of course, is why did they decide to maintain the prosodic system? They could have uh, uh, gone, gone the, old, uh, the, the other way around, skip prosody altogether, which they did in the liturgical poetry. The liturgical mm -hmm. poetry is not based on uh, any vowel length. It is simply number of syllables and stresses uh, at a certain point. Just as think of the, the, the iambic pentameter of Shakespeare, well, what is the iambic pentameter of Shakespeare? It's 10 syllables, sometimes 11, but usually 10. And you have stresses on positions two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Uh, it's that simple. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, the medical system followed by the uh, poets of liturgical hymns is exactly that. So what, what the, it, it's about the number of syllables and it's about the number or uh, the position of the stresses within those uh, syllables. But uh, leaving aside liturgical poetry, and some forms of vernacular poetry where you do where you, you don't have prosody, but uh, then there's still a huge uh, amount of poetry written in the Byzantine uh, period, where their authors somehow try to uh, keep the prosodic system intact. And the question, of course, is why? And there's no good answer to it apart from saying, well. It is a tradition. It is considered to be something uh, by in which you can excel as a poet, because there is a, a huge premium on excelling in writing in a kind of language that is no longer existent, uh, and uh, try to do it elsewhere. Because the, the point, the general point is that apart from uh, those changes in uh, pronunciation, so the loss of prosodic uh, length of vowels change from pitch to stress accent, that's the point that the Byzantines continued to write in a kind of Greek that no longer uh, uh, was the kind of Greek they were speaking at home. So there's a huge difference between Hellenica, Greek on the one hand, and Romaica, which is the, 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 the language of the Romans, that, that's the language they spoke. And obviously there is a link because it's all part of a long history of the Greek language, but there are huge changes, and that too becomes clear if you look at certain features of uh, learned Byzantine poetry and prose, where you see that they appear to be making that they appear to make making mistakes. These are not mistakes. It's simply the fact that things have changed in the, in the meanwhile. So, so um, the the perception of the language has changed. And that too influences the way people write. What I always tell my students is that if you want to become an, uh, a good Byzantine philologist, you first of all need to know good classical Greek, uh, 
but you also need to know more than Greek. You can't without the, both, and then you can approach the the the, the text of the, the fate. Business Greek was very difficult to to assess from both sides, and you get a feeling for for what is going on. But otherwise, you're lost. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, and the question as to you know why they preserved ancient forms in poetry that can just be asked more generally about it. You know, they're most of what they wrote, which uh -huh. used you know optatives and datives and things like this, which no one was using in speech. Uh, so it just it's a broader question about Byzantine writing. Uh -huh. uh, so now that we've talked about what Byzantine poetry is not, this sort of, you know, either romantic or straightforwardly classical, let's talk a little bit about what it was and what it was trying to do. And let's start with the, the sort of the, the site, the, the, the place of Byzantine poetry in, in, its, in its original context. So with a few exceptions, we're not talking about, uh, you know, authors who wrote poems in order to put them together in a, in a book of poems and have people read their poetry. But we're talking about poems that were, that were put in particular places, usually to accompany something, right? Whether an object or an event. Uh, so, yeah, what, can you give us a sense of the range of the, this original context? So where were these poems placed? The, the range is incredibly large. There must have been inscriptions everywhere. It's nowadays uh, difficult to, 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 to see because so much of well, the Byzantine Empire uh, is no longer intact. I mean, Constantinople no longer exists. So let's start just by describing what you could have seen. There would have been uh, verse inscriptions on city walls, bridges, aqueducts. There would have been inscriptions on the facades of churches and monastery, monasteries, on cemeteries. There would have been inscriptions on tombs. There would have been inscriptions inside the church and monasteries, both in the narthex, so the, the, uh, but also approaching uh, the, the inner sanctum of the church. Yeah, there would be church uh, inscriptions everywhere, all in meter. Um, you would have inscriptions on icons, small artifacts, uh, um, uh, Tapestries hanging uh, in the churches. There too, um, might have embroidered texts. You might find meter in uh, lead seals, uh, seals mm -hmm. uh, inscriptions of, uh, as usually from from the 11th century onward. There too, um, which is very strange. Why on earth would you identify yourself? I am Anthony Caldelli's uh, 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 in in meter. Why? Uh, but it did it. You find well, this inscription on inkpot, and sometimes the, these uh, inscriptions are surprisingly long. I mean, if, um, think of the, the Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul. If you go there, what you will find, uh, see when you enter the church are large marble slabs with uh, what is called the Edict of uh, 1166. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge text. But uh, um, that's one is in prose. But we do know, for instance, that in the same 11th century, there is, uh, we have this Pentocrator monastery founded by Emperor John Cominos. That too had a long founding document in meter and inscribed in the church. And then read out each year at the uh, inaugural feast of, of, the, of the monastery. Um, so the, there are inscriptions everywhere, and apart from inscriptions, of course, texts are being performed. There's a huge discussion, discussion that is going on among those working on inscriptions, where the people would read out these inscriptions to other people. I'm not entirely convinced that that's the question, but there's certainly a possibility that uh, people did read out those texts uh, to other people. Uh, and apart from, uh, the, well, the performative nature of inscriptions, if there is any. We have performances of ceremonial poetry. We have the hymns of the deems, which are within circus factions, and comia. Uh, we have, it was customary um, as from the 11th century onward to read out a poem before the reading of the homily in the church. So you, and uh, apart from ceremonial poetry, there is an awful lot of poetry in schools or in what are called 
theater, theater or kind of literary salons where people would come together and discuss poetry and prose and the ancient authors and uh, whatever. And that to both in the schools and the theater, the theater are basically a, a kind of scholastic environment for adults, for people, uh, for grown-ups. Um, people would perform and read out text to, it, to each other, uh, prose, but also poetry. There's a lovely poem uh, describing a boat trip on the Bosporus ah, yes. in the uh, early 11th century. And, um, and there we get a description of what they, what they would do. So for first they were drinking wine because, well, it's, it's a boat trip. You, you won't have a pleasant time. So they drink wine, talking to each other. But then at some point, well, you thought, well, it's time for some good amusement. Let's read out. Uh, and then you get, I think they were reading Sophocles or Euripides, and some Homer and some uh, prose, but also probably their own uh, 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 literary pro pro production. So their own literary text who've been reading out and, and listening to it and then criticizing it. It's everywhere. Yes, uh, I get the sense that living in Constantinople, especially if you were literate, uh, but also to a certain degree if you were not, but it was being immersed in poetry and epigrams. They're written all over the place. They are a function of, they're, they're a part of the liturgy and court life and the hippodrome and you know slogans and and, and, and this is one aspect that is be being recovered, I think, in a, in a lot of recent scholarship is the materiality of poetry, mm -hmm. where, because today we encounter it in, you know, textual editions, which are kind of abstractions from the original site, mm -hmm. but the materials in which they were displayed, carved, you know, or written, the colors that sometimes they would have been like, I, I have the impression, like, like on the Theodosian obelisk base, right? There are two epigrams. I, mm -hmm. I have the impression that those, the letters would have been painted in so that they could be seen more clearly from afar. Mm -hmm. So it was a sort of very kind of a, a immersive experience here. And it's almost like so many things came with their poetic commentary attached to, to them. It's almost like a, like I think it's like in, in modern comic books where there's a little blurb where the character is speaking, there's a little bubble and they're mm -hmm. saying something. And it's almost as if all these objects are saying that thing and there's a little bubble above them. Mm -hmm. And and so yeah, the 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 poem and the and the object or the event or the context are very closely entwined that way. And and yeah, it, I mean, obviously we have to read those things together. So can you walk us through the steps? Of, a, of the production of a poem, kind of its history, because there are a number of different agents involved in all of this, not just the poet and, and, mm -hmm. and, and context. So just kind of give us some, some feeling as to how uh, the, the history of the production of a poem from its inception down to when it ends up in a manuscript. Well, obviously the, the, the various, uh, um, there's not a single answer to it, but uh, let's look at a, so an epigram on a work of art, usually there will be a patron, uh, someone commissioning a poet to write the text. Usually this person is of such a, a elite status that he doesn't do it himself. So there are always middlemen. So in, uh, there are some references to people asking other people to, to, to write or to rewrite a text. Um, Sometimes poems ask to revise the work of other poets. So that there's this aspect is patronage. It's difficult to, to assess what's going on uh, exactly. In the past, people were under the impression that if a poem tells us that so-and-so painted uh, an icon or decorated a church, that he did it himself, well, that's total nonsense. It, it, it simply means that he or she asked someone to Right, uh, <laughs> etc., and actually also ask another person, the painter, to do the produce the artwork. So that that's the, the starting point. It's the, the patronage. Then, after the text has been composed, uh, first it will go to a person uh, putting it on the actual artwork. There's one. Um, I think it's um, a cross where the carver 
uh, was mistaken and um, also copied the directions, the, the orders that uh, uh, <laughs> uh, to, uh, together with the epigrams, with the epigram, the order. Uh, uh, it's used by the words, uh, put this on the cross, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, which is quite funny. Uh, uh, and so, so we have also that part. And then, of course, once the, 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 the work of art has been produced and there is this lovely epigram written on it, but that's not the end of it because the, the author of the text may be very proud of, of, of his uh, uh, lovely epigram and may present it to his friends in one of those literary fair that they will come together, have a good glass of wine, and he will say, well, let's listen to my last epigram. And then at some point there is a, uh, there is a question um, of copying it down in a manuscript that is more rare than you would expect. Uh, my feeling is that most of Byzantine prose and poetry was never copied uh, uh, in a final form. And there is also, and that's, I think it is important to remember, there is a, uh, a difference between the text as it was performed or uh, read out or, or originally composed for a uh, uh, work of art and the text that we find in a manuscript. A good example is, is the poetry collection of a person called John Mavropoulos, who was an intellectual in uh, 11th century uh, Constantinople, at some point against his will became metropolitan of a provincial town called Yokoita. He, at the end of his life, he produced a collection of his literary works consisting of prose, orations, and poetry. As far as we can reconstruct what's going on, he rewrote all those literary works uh, for the manuscript. And it's not just that, it's not a, uh, just a matter of polishing the text. Well, that, that's, uh, that's what we all would do before presenting our work to, to the outside world. But it is also the fact that the way in which he presents his uh, letters, poems, ovations, clearly is a form of self-representation. It is uh, portraying a kind of image the poor Byzantine intellectual exiled to, mm. to, to the province, which means that um, all those literary texts assume a different meaning within the manuscript, uh, different from what they originally may have had. So for instance, there are quite a number of epigrams uh, written for works of art commissioned by uh, Emperor Constantine Monomachos, mid 15th, uh, 11th century, and normally these would have been the ordinary epigrams uh, you may find on any work of art. However, within the context of the poetry, uh, well, not the poetry collection, the collection of literary works, these um, have quite different meaning. It is the portrayal of a, a kind of literary society for which the poet at the end of his life longs. He, he wants to, um, mm -hmm. it, it, um, it, these were the good old times when uh, things were going good. When we, well, we all had uh, a lot of fun in Constantinople together with Michael Psalos and yeah. Christopher Mitilineos, we're all having uh, a ball in, uh, uh, in Constantinople. But that means that texts have assumed a slightly different meaning from what they had originally. And the same goes when, when you go further down the line because obviously a manuscript may or may not be copied. And, but the, the question of course is when a 14th century intellectual copies an 11th or 12th century text, what is the purpose? Why does he copy it? Well, presumably because he likes the text or he thinks it is useful or it, it can, but um, it is clear that, uh, that Every time that a manuscript, uh, that a text is copied, it assumes a slightly different meaning from what it may have had uh, when it was originally uh, produced. And this goes down all the way to our modern editions, because uh, we, when we talk about context, we must bear in mind that um, we are part of this change of context. I mean, we, we are the ones reading the text and uh, interpreting the text and, uh, and, of course, imposing our own views on the text we are uh, reading. So um, the whole process of contextualization, uh, contextualization goes on uh, right up to, to well, to, to, the, to the two books I've written on based on poetry. Yeah, you've written, you know, quite eloquently about how poems change their meaning and their significance when they're 
transposed from one material to a different material, from one context to another, when they're juxtaposed with other texts or write different poems. Uh, I mean, for me, one of the most striking examples is the epigram for the Church of St. Polyuctus of Anikia Juliana, right? So it's like 100 verses, which we read in like three pages, but originally it was carved, part of it was outside the church and part of it was meandering along the interior. And in order to read it, you'd have to, you know, walk along the arches and look up and down and go around and, and you're, you're getting a, a, a physical experience of the building as well while you're reading the poem. And, and that's just a completely different experience uh, than when it's put together in a collection of, uh, you know, epigrams on buildings, say, or something like that. It's, it's very different. Um, so we actually know about at least a couple Byzantine scholars who went around collecting epigrams, and you've written about them, uh, Dionysius the Studite and Gregory of Kamsa. Can you tell us a little bit about their work? Because it lies at the heart of some of the, these collections that we have today. Yep. The, the things they did were quite unique. We do not have that many Byzantine epigraphers. I, I know a few in the 12th century, and you can't compare it to what you see in the West. In the West, there are, uh, beginning from the Carolingian period, uh, uh, a steady pro uh, production of sulogai, epigraphic sulogai, where they would collect inscriptions or late antique, but also medieval inscriptions. That is not very common in uh, uh, Byzantium. The, there are two noteworthy exceptions, and these are the two you mentioned. Gregory of Kamsa was a schoolmaster uh, in Constantinople at the school of Tanner. The, that's a huge uh, church built in the ninth century by Emperor Basil I. And he clearly was interested in uh, late antique and early medieval inscriptions, which he collected in situ. So, um, and not just in Constantinople, but also elsewhere. I'm not entirely certain whether he actually went to Thessaloniki and other places in Asia Minor to uh, copy those inscriptions in situ. He may have asked friends to do it for him. But it's clear from the titles given to, the, to, to those epigrams that they were actually copied in situ. And it's a large collection. Um, the collection itself no longer exists, but it has been incorporated into uh, what is called the Greek ethology, which is the most important uh, ethology of classical and late antique and uh, medieval poetry, put together by um, uh, a fellow teacher at the same school of Tanea called uh, Constantine Kefalas. So Gregory and Kamsa and Constantine Kefalas were, uh, were colleagues. But we can be fairly certain that it's Gregory of Kamsa who will have copied all those texts, walking through Constantinople, going to monasteries, churches, looking at manuscripts and just copying, which is not always easy. Uh, please remember that a text uh, which is inscribed may be difficult to decipher, standing from mm. third level. It, it, um, there are, in fact, some inscriptions that we cannot read with the naked eye. I mean, the, if you go to the what is left of the uh, Pantocrator Monastery, there's one running around the walls. Uh, uh, I can't read it. And uh, I've asked other people whether they can read the text. No, they can't. So that there is a problem. Um, and that's a problem Gregory too were faced. Um, for instance, to, to give you an example of the, 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 the kind of problems he, he, he were faced is, is some of the inscriptions he copied in C2 have also come down to us via a manuscript tradition. And if you compare the manuscript tradition to the inscriptional tradition, to what Greg you see, you see differences. And that's partly because, uh, uh, maybe because the author, after having written the verse inscription, uh, for one reason or another, decided to change the text. And that's what we find in our manuscript. But it also may be simply the question that uh, Gregory of Kamsa was unable to uh, decipher the text correctly uh, from where he was standing. Then it's certain that his um, paths have crossed those of Dionysius to Studite, who in, at exactly the same time, that's the late 9th century, was walking through 
Constantinople in search of different epigrams. Whereas Gregory Comstock was interested in uh, the antique, the late antique past uh, of Constantinople, Dionysus Sudite was a monk, uh, a monk of the famous Studios Monastery, and he was looking for the written traces of the work of the famous abbot of the Studios Monastery, uh, Theodore of Studios. O obviously, he started working in the monastery itself, that's to view, but then moved to all the monasteries that have a link with uh, uh, that's to view, either because they have were founded by the Studite movement or because they were uh, uh, friends to Dionysius, uh, to Theodore of Studios. And um, he too will have uh, 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 copied. And, and the, the interesting thing is that Gregory of Kamsa copied one of the verse inscriptions inside the Studios monastery. But since that was a late antique inscription, not one written by Theodore of Studios, Dionysius Studite was not interested. So, uh, but they may have stand, been standing next to one right. of the epigrams uh, of doing their job and were very grateful to them because without them, life would be much more difficult for art historians because some, some, some of the things they describe are lost, can't be retrieved. I mean, the Studios Monastery is nowadays a very sad monument uh, uh, mm. in Istanbul. It, looking at the, at, at the sad relics of the, the, the monastery is hard to believe that there were inscriptions everywhere. So mm -hmm. in the uh, dining room, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, uh, 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 all, all around the place, which is a bit strange, but yep. It occurs to me, now that I'm hearing you, that one could write a, an interesting book on life in Constantinople, maybe even for like a popular audience <laughs> that, would, that would begin its discussion of every aspect of life with an epigram and its context and just sort of pick up from there because yes when you mentioned bathrooms i recalled agathias's epigrams for the uh, mm -hmm. latrines right and, and the sewers of his city and so these were really put everywhere and and military life and monastic life and the church and so forth they all had these little accompanying epigrams so let's talk about an aspect that might we might find some difficulty in covering this way, which is love life, right? The, the erotic life of the Byzantines. And you've, you've written about this quite a bit too. And that love and the erotic had some challenges and sort of making it in, you know, bursting onto the Byzantine poetic scene. And, and so you've written that, now I want to get this right here, that love did not do well at all in Byzantium and was largely absent between 600 and 1100. And then apart from some sort of brief revivals, it resurfaces in the 12th century, but had at first to pretend to be ancient and afterwards to be Western, Oriental, Homeric, allegorical, or fairy tale, but hardly ever unabashedly Byzantine. So is this, is this the one topic that the Byzantines felt very squeamish about letting into their poetry? Yes, I, I, I guess so. I mean, there the are quite a number of references to sexual activities, but these are usually um, quite negative. So if you write a satire about uh, your opponent, your political opponent, you will uh, accuse him of all kinds of lewd activities, but that has nothing to do with uh, eroticism as we understand it. Right. It's, simply, it's uh, simply being very gross and unpleasant about another person. But it is very difficult to find real love poetry. And I do think that the Byzantines were a bit squeamish about it. That is to say, they were a bit squeamish about it in the kind of poetry they would present to one another as forms of literature. Because if you now go to the vernacular tradition, there you see that there is a lively production of love, love songs. These are called Cataloya, and the Cataloya uh, can be found in collections starting from the 14th century onward. But as I tried to do in my book, is if you look at poetry of early centuries, then you can find a hidden history of the Cataloya. I mean, they were there, they were there in the ninth century, but people somehow felt a kind of reluctance to refer to it. I mean, you find a, a song performed during the wedding of the emperor in the Book of Ceremonies that clearly uh, falls into the genre of 
the the Venetian love song, um, and there is a, a phase change, a, a 9th century poem in which uh, the 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 the, the, talk, the poet is uh, tries to catch up with eros, but eros can't be caught. Um, but if you look at the metaphors used, the language used, then you can clearly recognize the tradition. But um, the fact remains that if apart from uh, the hidden tradition of love, love poetry, which uh, uh, must have existed, mm. uh, that you doesn't be, it doesn't surface in, in into uh, official kind of poetry, and it's pretty a form of uh, 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 um, It surprises yeah. me that they would never write these kinds of poems, for example, for their wives. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. You know, maybe the the audience was understood to be so masculine from the start, like I'm addressing this to fellow logii, right, learned people like myself, which, you know, probably most wives wouldn't fall into that category. I, I want to impress my, you know, fellow writers. But uh, nevertheless, I, I don't know, it, it's strange. I mean, why don't we have that kind of love epigram addressed to maybe for an object that you give to your wife? Or, I don't know. It's I don't, No, we don't. I mean, um... Uh, apart from the, the, the vernacular tradition, there's only one, well, exceptional case that that's the poetry of of a saint and mystic uh, Saint Simeon, uh, the new theologian, right. who um, has, um, well, uh, uh, amorous encounters with God all the time. And the, the kind of uh, poetry, I mean, the, the images he uses are quite outspoken sometimes and, and clear. And there are passages in his literary work that read as love poetry. Uh, uh, um, uh, but of course, this is the love between an, uh, uh, an individual and God. Uh, but th there is a strong sensual uh, message in his poetry. Yeah, I mean, addressing or de declaring love for God is you know, pretty pretty common in, in, in lots of media. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll look through your book again. I'll see if I can find... <laughs> See what we can turn up, uh, because there's a, you know, ample corpus from the sixth century. Um, I've I've spoken about that in an earlier episode with uh, Stephen Smith. Mm -hmm. he wrote a book, uh, yeah, uh, on that, and the vernacular poems later on have you know the more sort of chivalric, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heterosexual love stories and so forth. But uh, yeah, there's it's a strange uh, gap there in the middle. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, anyway, Mark, uh, we're, we're out of time. This was wonderful. L let me just say, I'm going to, I think it would be a good idea to give the audience a sense of some of these epigrams because we've been talking about them and I'll, I think I should probably put them in the introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and I also want to, uh, I think, uh, recite the, um, the, uh, the Bosporus Journey poem. Uh, isn't this the, the anonymous Sola? Yep. Yeah. Any any yeah. final thoughts about like Byzantine poetry or where people can turn to or what what we should be doing? Well, so start reading. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that's all my advice to everybody. I mean, I mean, there are quite a number of marvelous poets. Uh, Mary mentioned two, so there's Christopher Mitilin Nels and John Marvel. And you don't even know, have to know uh, Greek because they have been translated into English quite recently, so, um, and that's a, a good place to start. Yes, yes, that's in the uh, Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library uh, series, folks, yep. if you haven't seen that yet, yeah, check it out. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much, Mark, and... Uh... Okay, bye-bye, Anthony, bye. <laughs>